Hi there everyone, we're at the Royal Society and we're right near the President's office so we have to be a little bit quiet and today's video is about someone whose name is very difficult to pronounce. Not Rupert Baker, whose name is easy to pronounce, he works here at the Royal Society, but this guy here, Rupert, I'm going to let you do the honours. Tycho Brahe is probably what I would say, but I did a tour a few years ago for some Danish students who set me straight, it's something like Tuko Bra. I'm going to call him Tycho for the purposes of this video. One thing I do know, well I know two things, I know there's a crater on the moon named after him, which I've always called Tycho and now I feel silly, and the other thing I know is about his nose. <laughs> well you can see in the portrait that is a very odd looking nose. He actually lost part of the original in a sword fight with his cousin. It was his cousin? Yeah, and I think it was full on broadswords in a darkened room as well, so... Uh, they'd had an <laughs> argument about mathematics, about who was the better mathematician. And it ended and with settled it with a duel with broadswords. This wasn't a contemporary portrait, this no. was done after he died. Yeah, I think you can probably tell that because it's got a telescope in, or what looks like a telescope to me. Tycho died in 1601 and the telescope really was effectively invented about eight years later. Okay. Used by Galileo, so maybe he's pointing to the future. Nice gesture. Yeah, I mean his star catalogue was the best one of its time, the best pre-telescopic star catalogue accuracy, four times better than anything anyone else was producing, through an incredible set of scientific instruments that he constructed in the book that we're going to see in a few minutes. Alright, we're going to go downstairs to the book room and have a look. Let's do it. Alright Rupert, you figured out where the book is? Yeah, so All this right. is the catalogue entry. All right. Um, it's called Astronomiae Instaurante Mechanica, catalogued there with the date 1598. Now you were talking to me on the way down the stairs about elks or something? What's going on? <laughs> what was this? Tycho had a pet elk. He had a pet elk? Yeah, according to one of the more fanciful versions of his life story, he, if he didn't want to go to a party he'd send his elk instead. Right. But one night he sent it to some people who got it very drunk and it fell down the stairs and died. Oh, I've heard that story. The Dreer, the drunk elk. He uh, sounds like quite a character. He that. does, yeah. He had a clairvoyant dwarf. He also did some astronomy. All right. This yeah. is, we, should, we should focus on the... Uh, this is important. Focus on the science bit. So here it is. All right. It's a... Uh, Astronomiae Instaurante Mechanica. 1598. All right, Rupert. What do we got? Well, the first thing we're going to do is open this book to the front. It's got a modern binding, obviously. And notice the first page of this book, A2. A2. So these old books normally have leaves with A1, A2, A3, A4, etc. And then it goes into the next folio. This one starts on A2. There is no A1, so there's no title page. Normally where you'd find the place and date of publication. Somebody has handwritten, von der Bergei, 1598. 1598. Yeah. 1598. Yeah. All right. And we've got this wonderful image here. This is presumably something he would use. Yeah, basically all the illustrations in this book are the astronomical instruments that Tycho used to help with his naked eye observations of the stars from his observatory called Uraniborg on the Danish island. He basically owned the whole island. He sounds amazing. I would love to have hung out with him as long as he didn't get the broadswords out. <laughs> yes. Okay, so... And we come back to that. So right. let's look at some more of the instruments. So the writing's in Latin. Even Rupert is not fluent in Latin as far as I know. So um, we're going to... No, my Latin's pretty rubbish to be but honest. But we'll just look at the pretty pictures of these instruments. And they're pretty typical typical of what you would expect from someone who's having to observe the sky before telescopes. Notice that they're woodcuts as well, they're nice woodcuts, so they're not metal plate engravings yet. There are a couple, but these are woodcuts. How can you tell that's a woodcut as opposed to a metal -like engraving? I looked it up. Oh. <laughs> Uh, they're slightly, they're slightly rougher. It's been annotated in the margins yeah. somewhere, and we'd love to know what those are. Those look pretty old, contemporary. Unfortunately, they've been trimmed a bit as well, so you can't read the whole thing. Oh. Somebody's rebound it and trimmed it. Now that's, um, oh, like that's that. an engraving, so you see that slightly finer detail. Nice. That looks like Tycho himself, that's doesn't it? That's the man it? himself, yeah. And, and a... that is a really, really badly drawn dog. Oh, that is. That. that looks like it was drawn by that woman that did the restoration of Jesus. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> Actually, it looks like I drew it. And look, the sun's got a face. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can't see the so there's elk. there's a date on there, 1587. So that was when he was in the peak of his sort of observing years in okay. the Uraniborg Observatory. That is fantastic. Oh, yeah, it's a real picture of sort of power and privilege. Even the instruments, though, have lots of ornate features to them, don't they? They're yeah. not just purely functional, like these little people on top of this instrument here. Surely they're not necessary to the science. No. When he lost his castle and he fell out of favour with the new king of Denmark, he had to move on to the court in Prague. So obviously he's trying to sort of big himself up a little bit and uh, show what magnificent instruments he creates. Rupert, what would you call this thing? It's almost like an end of chapter marker. But uh, I'm sure there's a technical name for that. But yeah. um, It's gorgeous, isn't it? Like, again, it's just full of detail. Below the line, comments welcome on the, what that's actually called. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure, sure there's a name for I'm it. I'm sure. 
Well, that's nice. That's nice. That's his great uh, celestial globe. Oh. And around this time, he's coming up with his theory of the solar system. So he reckons the moon goes around the Earth, the sun goes around the Earth, but then all the planets go around the sun. Ah. Didn't last. Sorry, oh. there's the uh, island of Uraniborg, Uraniburgi, the castle of the heavens. This is his home, is it? Yeah, so it's the castle and its gardens. Nice digs! Yeah, and he had his own paper making workshop on the premises as well, so this is probably printed on paper that was made at the workshop in Uraniborg, and then that's the whole island. Wow. So Rupert, there's something about this illustration you want to point out? Yeah, that's an engraving, so I've done with a metal plate, but in 1598 it was a woodcut. Ah. So we've got what we thought and what is catalogued as the 1598 edition of this book. Right. But I recently helped a researcher who was doing a survey of all the remaining copies of the 1598 book sent us some pictures. And she got straight back to me and said, no, that's an engraving. That's not the 1598 edition because they broke the woodcut when they did that. So all this time you thought you had a first edition. Yeah. And then this obviously <laughs> uber expert on yep. first edition said no and that's a smoking gun this was a year after was it 99 or something uh, it's 1602 so it's four years more recent yeah and the other thing she said to prove this is she said what side of the map of the island of haven is the compass rose and i said yeah it's top right and she said yeah in the 1598 edition of the book it's in top left ah so that is another proof that we have the later edition okay and if we go back to the inscriptions at the beginning. That's handwritten because the original title page is mysteriously missing. And if you turn to the next page, there's an ownership signature of a guy called Evans from the Royal Military Academy at Woolwich. I've been trying to work out his first name. I think it's JS, but I'm willing to be proved wrong on that. It might be FS. And he bought this book at Mr. Dalrymple's sale on the 12th of June, 1809. So it's not something the Royal Society has had right since the beginning. Right. I'm not even sure how it came into our collections after that. Evans has written this work being extremely rare. So he thinks he's bought a 1598 edition, obviously. I'm slightly suspicious of Mr. Dalrymple and his book sale. I don't want to offend any Dalrymple descendants out there, but this one may just have been pulling a fast one, don't you think? So do you think maybe the title page was deliberately removed because that was the evidence that it was a second edition? Yeah, I and mean, that's very speculative, isn't it? It's great to hear from researchers who really know what they're talking about when they sort of get into the fine details of your book and you do find out some very interesting, very interesting things. So if there are any other precious books here at the Royal Society that you would like to drop the value of by letting, <laughs> Rupert, by letting Rupert know some little, little nuggets like this, do get in touch. Yes, one, gently, one at a time. Oh, look at this. You can see here, yep. it's got Royal Society written on it, engraved. They did number all of their instruments, as you can see. And you can also see the maker's mark just here. So John Bird, he's inscribed his name. Oh, oh, yeah. and there we go. What we'll do yeah. is put the box down on the floor. So let me take that one. You got it? Got that. 